I'm kind of confused. Everyone keeps saying that Republicans are destroying American democracy. This is a coordinated attack on our democracy. 21st century Jim Crow assault is real. Like, obviously this isn't a great sign for our democracy. Things got really nasty and violent, but ultimately our democracy held, right? Democrats say that the GOP is retooling the voting system in their favor. It's anti-democratic. They are quite literally trying to dismantle democracy. Like, should we actually be terrified about the future of American democracy? And what exactly am I afraid of here? Like, what is actually the threat? And we're going to the Capitol. So much of this is caught up in like polarizing, vague political rhetoric. To get to the bottom of this, I asked for help from Michelle Cottle, a seasoned political reporter who's written for a bunch of top publications, who's covered elections of every type from presidential all the way down to like local school boards. She's now on the Times editorial board and is probably one of the best people to help line me out on how freaked out I need to be about American democracy. Hi, how's it going? Good, how are you doing? Michelle brought me deep into the plumbing of American democracy, something I hadn't ever seen before. She showed me something that changed the way I see my country something playing out in the darkest corners of American politics. A quiet mobilization of money by people who are fighting to reclaim what they believe was stolen from them and who are seeking to change not only who can vote in this country, but who counts those votes. An attempt to reshape our election system without any of us really knowing. Ultimately, Michelle showed me that yes, I should be pretty damn scared about the future of our democracy, but not for the reasons I expected. Why wouldn't they make all the machines available immediately? Republicans in Congress are spreading ah, conspiracy ah, theories. Ah, 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 you got to contest every ballot. This election was a fraud. My big question has been like, how real is this threat? Like how worried should we actually be about this? So when people think of threats to democracy, usually the first place they go is voter suppression, in part because it's just the easiest to explain. This map shows all of the states that have passed laws that make it harder to vote in recent years. There's like dozens of these laws since 2020. These laws are all over the place. You can shrink the time window for applying for absentee ballots. Making it harder to find drop boxes where you can like submit your vote. Tighten requirements for voter ID. Making it easier to purge registration so that people have to re-register. Ban snacks and Making water. it harder to Limit vote the number early. Of harder places. registration. Creating general confusion around voting. To make it as unpleasant and difficult to vote as humanly possible. But hold on a second. This used to really confuse me. Why would a political party want to make fewer people vote? Like, how does that help the Republicans? Well, it turns out that the logic here is that if it's easier to vote, lower income Americans, minorities, young people, who usually vote in lower numbers, will turn out in higher numbers and vote for Democrats. So the GOP is making it harder to vote so they can win elections. That is the conventional wisdom here. It turns out that this logic is a little bit simplistic and it often has an unintended effect or the opposite happens of what people are expecting. Political scientists have been studying this recently. And these studies have been finding that even though both parties kind of take this assumption for granted, that easier voting benefits Democrats, that's not always the case. And that it can often be the opposite. Like this study from the University of Utah that shows that more mail-in voting actually benefits Republicans. Huh? What? That doesn't make any sense. Isn't it the Republicans that are voting all these voter suppression laws? In the last couple of years, Virginia has gone the opposite direction of voter suppression. They passed laws to make it easier to vote. And what we saw last year was that voters turned out at a vastly higher rate than they had in probably two decades. And Republicans swept the statewide offices and they took back the House of Delegates. So it was the exact inverse of what people expect in these situations. Remember last March when President Biden called Georgia's restrictive voting laws? Jim Crow 2.0. And yet this last summer's primaries, the first election since these laws were passed, went really smoothly and early voting surged. At the end of the day, like this voter suppression stuff is maybe overblown and not that important. So let's not let the GOP off the hook here. This mission to erect barriers is anti-democratic. These laws are appalling and, and frankly racist, but the laws are unpredictable 
and can also wind up discouraging Republican voters to turn out as well. Does that mean that the death of democracy is kind of just overblown here and that we shouldn't actually be that worried? Oh, no, 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 no. I did not say that. I just said that voter suppression efforts aren't as predictable and sometimes not as effective as people fear they are. But there is something else going on. Something that way fewer people are paying attention to, in part because it's unsexy, tedious, complicated, boring, and generally taking place way down the political food chain at the state level and even the hyper-local level. Frankly, anytime I hear local politics, like I know we're supposed to pay attention to it, but I kind of like start to fall asleep. It's like not where I want to pay my attention. But this is what should really tick you off and scare the holy living shit out of you. It has less to do with controlling who can vote and everything to do with who decides which votes actually count. And this is where Michelle pointed me in a different direction, away from fixating on voter suppression and instead encouraging me to look deeper into the very plumbing of the American voting system. This space that most of us have never really looked at. So welcome to our incredibly decentralized voting system in America. It's where you vote. It's where your votes are counted. It's the poll workers and precinct officers and county commissioners and election boards and secretaries of state that certify results. Most of us don't know anything about this. Because honestly, most of us want this version of politics. The 2020 race is revving up. Whoa! Bring it on. But it's down here where the votes are cast, where they are totaled, where we meet the people who count those votes. The government officials you've never thought about. A county clerk in New Mexico, a precinct officer in Michigan, a secretary of state in Nevada. And no, not that secretary of state. Every state has a secretary of state and it is way less sexy than international diplomacy. But yeah, according to Michelle, this is where the action is, where the real assault on our democracy is happening. Trump's great gift as a top-notch demagogue is getting people fired up to believe whatever he tells them is true. That gets really dark really quickly. So if you want to understand it, you're going to have to stick with me as we dive into this system. Because it's this system that is being infiltrated by an army of Trump-supporting Americans to re-rig the system that they believe was rigged against them in 2020. Biden's lead over a thousand now. The new direction of the Republican Party has to do with what Trump and his allies failed to do in 2020. Trump claimed fraud and immediately cobbled together dozens of lawsuits to challenge the vote. If you count the legal votes, I easily win. Was there any real evidence of widespread voter fraud that these lawsuits were based on? No, absolutely not. These were completely absurd claims and pretty much all of them got immediately tossed out. And while he did not succeed in overturning the election, he really did succeed in planting the seeds of doubt in our system. So here we are over a year and a half later and those seeds that were planted by then the most powerful man on earth, conspiracy and victimhood and doubt in the system, those seeds have sprouted and spread to every corner of our country. We can never allow an election to be stolen like that. Oh, and this isn't some like right-wing fringe movement who believes this. 71% of Republicans, when asked, say that they don't think that Joe Biden actually won the 2020 election fairly. 71% when literally there is no evidence for that. Trump's allies at all levels of power would build a plan, a plan to ensure that this legal flop that happened in 2020 would never happen again. The scam will be before the United States Supreme Court. This is rampant corruption and it can't happen. It simply can't happen. Welcome to the multi-layered Republican strategy to retake America from the ground up. A widespread and pretty sophisticated movement to infiltrate this. The strategy is to challenge votes at every level of the system by claiming widespread voter fraud, especially focusing on democratic precincts. Something that, to be crystal clear, there is zero evidence for, but that 70% of Republicans think is real. The strategy starts with recruiting, calling voters to get involved here at the lowest level where your vote is cast and initially counted. Recruiting often looks like this. 
This is a Save America newsletter that Trump sent out to his followers back in February. Trump calls his people to mobilize at the lowest level, the precinct level, to influence how elections are run. We can take over the party if we invade it. Trump says that this is key to, quote, taking back our great country from the ground up. Recruiting is also happening big time in right-wing media, especially on Steve Bannon's podcast. We're taking this back village by village, precinct by precinct, and they can't stop it. Bannon has been telling his legions of listeners to defend America by signing up to work at their local precincts on election day. We're taking action. And that action is we're taking over school boards, we're taking over the Republican Party from the precinct committee strategy, we're taking over all the elections. Suck on this. I'm gonna show you what the end goal is here because it's pretty nuts. But first, I want it to be clear that this recruiting is actually working. Name me another nation on earth that has- After Bannon's battle cries on his podcast, ProPublica found that 8,500 new Republicans signed up for low-level precinct positions in 41 of the 65 counties they contacted. ProPublica found that there was no such surge among Democrats. So I'm telling you, this is what should scare the hell out of you. In my precinct, I have 11 slots. I filled all 11 with conservatives. So they've recruited all of these election deniers. A lot of these people have never been involved in politics before, but they've been mobilized, moved. And they think it is their patriotic duty to take back America. Like these aren't high power positions. So I've been kind of skeptical. Like how much can these election deniers actually do to affect the vote? And to get to the bottom of that, you have to look at a PowerPoint slide. This is the next phase of the plan which is to train all of these new recruits. This is a PowerPoint presentation from one of these trainings where local Republican chapters are priming these new recruits to look out for fraud and then preparing them by training them on all the voting rules that can be used to challenge votes. This has always been a thing. It's you can always challenge votes, but it's rarely used because reminder, there's no such thing as widespread election fraud in America, okay? But according to these people, it's everywhere and it's their duty to find that election fraud and to challenge votes whenever they have a feeling that there's something up. A complete record of the challenge must be entered in the challenged voters page in the poll book. A record must include the name of the person making the challenge, time of the challenge, name, address, a paper trail. They're starting to make a paper trail for every vote they challenge, every piece of fraud they think they see. This is where the strategy starts to work, where you can start to gather evidence of observed, perceived voter fraud that could potentially be used later on. Oh, and very important here at the bottom, call the Republican hotline. Politico got their hands on some leaked tapes from another one of these training sessions, this one in Michigan. But truly, it's gonna be an army. We are going to try to recruit lawyers. We're going to have more lawyers than have ever been recruited because let's be honest, that's where it's gonna be fought, right? This hotline gives these recruits immediate access to a lawyer who is sympathetic to their cause of election integrity, which is just a euphemism for re-rigging the election system. These lawyers will be on call on election day to walk these election deniers through the process of documenting suspected fraud so that Republican Party lawyers will now have a body of recorded evidence to use to legally challenge the vote if they need to. We're going to have lawyers that work early to build relationships with different judges. Do you see what they're doing here? They're creating exactly what Trump didn't have in all of his failed lawsuits in 2020. In 2020, Trump had to scramble retroactively, top down, to claim election fraud and to challenge those votes in court. We were winning in all the key locations by a lot, actually. And then our numbers started miraculously getting whittled away in secret. This time, they will be prepared. All of this training lays the groundwork to kickstart the process for challenging the election using the tedious, boring, bureaucratic processes at the very lowest level of the election system. You fill up all the vacant precinct committeeman slots and form a 75% voting majority at the precinct level. Then they go to their respective meetings where they elect the delegates who in turn elect the state chairman. So that next time around, they'll be in a position to stop the steal. This is boring stuff, I know. Now that I'm starting to understand it, let me paint a picture of how this might play out because this is really starting to terrify me. So imagine an upcoming election day. You're in a democratic precinct in a swing state and you go to your local polling station, like at your local middle school or something, 
and it's packed with a bunch of election workers and monitors who believe in the big lie about the 2020 election. Trump and other Republicans keep telling them that the system is rigged against them. It's a corrupt system, and it makes people corrupt even if they aren't by nature. They have been told that they are what stands between the fall of civilization. And there is no telling with that mindset what they're willing to do to re-rig the system as they see it. You gotta contest every ballot. And they've been told that it's actually only Democratic precincts that have voter fraud. So they're on the lookout. So you can imagine, they're now seeing fraud everywhere they look, and they're reporting it, swearing that they saw irregularities in the election. Maybe it's a van of people who showed up to the polling place to all vote together. Oh, those must be voters being trucked in from another precinct. They're probably double voting. Oh look, the poll worker didn't check their IDs very well. They're probably in cahoots together. That Dominion voting machine over there was making some weird sound. It's probably being hacked right now. That person doesn't look like they're actually a citizen. They're probably an illegal immigrant with a fake ID. Democratic operatives are probably paying them to be here. That kid over there does not look like he's 18. We should probably challenge their vote, since he's probably just a young recruit from the corrupt cabal who's been rigging the election system forever against us. We must fight back to save America. So they start invoking all these rarely used official election rules, and they start challenging almost every vote, making voters take these oaths and sign papers, documenting all of this into the poll book, the official record of the voting day. All of these challenges are now slowing everything down in this democratic precinct. There's now a massive line at your polling place. And so now, instead of just passing out the I voted stickers and monitoring elections generally, these election deniers are disrupting a perfectly normal, free, fair election, all while compiling a body of support supposedly official incidents of fraud that are being added to other reports of fraud happening all over the state because the same thing is happening in every precinct because these election deniers have been planning this for years. They don't have to hack into machines. They don't have to do anything in secret. Purely by being there in vast numbers across multiple counties in important swing states, this army, as their leaders call them, would be able to throw a wrench in this process that has always worked on trust and good faith, the bedrock of our democracy, now breaking down by these people who are now on a crusade to take back our great country by abusing the election system. Okay, wait, hold on, hold on, hold on. Let's just pause for a second and get some perspective here before we freak out. Yes, this is scary. Conspiracy-minded poll workers and election monitors sowing doubt and creating a legal nightmare. That's pretty worrisome. But these are like low-level election workers. They're like the worker bees on election day. Certainly, there have to be protections in the system to ensure that these bad actors can't sabotage our elections just because Steve Bannon told them to. Oh, they've got a plan for that, don't you worry. The precinct strategy is just one piece of this. There are lots of pieces that are being put in place. Oh, okay. We're taking 100 seats, and we're going to govern for 100 years. The next part of the plan focuses on the technical bureaucratic roles that each state has to run its elections, the county commissioners and secretaries of state. And again, like the poll worker precinct strategy, this part of the strategy is in response to what Trump failed to do in 2020. Joe Biden is edging ahead with 264 electoral college votes. When Trump realized that he was losing the state of Georgia in 2020, he called up this guy, a fellow Republican, Georgia's Secretary of State, Brad Raffensperger. A job that is kind of just like rubber stamping election results, but now suddenly became super important. I mean, you listen to this tape, it's freaking wild. And you've made it almost impossible for a Republican to win because of cheating, because they cheated like nobody's ever cheated before. And there's nothing wrong with saying that, you know, uh, that you've recalculated. Trump bullies this guy for like an hour on the phone. And then he finally just tells him point blank what he wants him to do. Look, all I want to do is this. I just want to find 11,780 votes. Well, Mr. President, the challenge that you have is the data you have is wrong. Ultimately, Raffensperger didn't bend to the bullying. But what this did is it showed Trump followers just how important this role is of Secretary of State. In most states, this is the person who certifies the final election results. So after this night, you have all of these election deniers starting to run for Secretary of State. I'm Wes Allen, and I've spent years fighting liberal attempts to change our elections. Chuck Gray, 
Wyoming's proven conservative champion, cracking down on election cheats. They're, you know, for low-level technical roles, you know, but suddenly after all the attention on how Team Trump attempted to kind of bully secretaries of state into helping them overthrow the 2020 race, these races are suddenly drawing a lot of notice and tons of campaign cash. One such candidate is this guy, Jim Marchant of Nevada which is a swing state. In 2020, Marchant also lost an election for Nevada state legislature. I was a victim of voter fraud. I ran for Congress here in Nevada and I won election day. I won early voting. Only after two weeks of fraudulent mail-in ballots did I lose. Feeling like the whole system was rigged against him and his party, Six months later, Jim Marchant is running to be Nevada Secretary of State. Jim will fight against voter fraud with voter ID, paper ballots, and full election audits. Jim is a winner. Oh, and he actually won the Republican primary. Marchant has said that he would not have certified the 2020 election results. Marchant ran on this platform, obsessing over election integrity. The people of Nevada have not elected anybody since 2006. They've been installed by the deep state cabal. Your vote hasn't counted for decades. You haven't elected anybody. The people that are in office have been selected. So how much power does this guy actually have to affect election results? Plenty, as the state's top election official, Nevada's Secretary of State, kind of helps set how elections are conducted and is responsible for investigating voting fraud claims. Marchant is just one of dozens of election deniers all around the country running for top state offices that oversee elections. And while some will lose their primary race and never get elected, many are winning in the primaries. Like like in Arizona, a very important swing state where Biden barely won. And now, where you have election deniers who have won the GOP primary for all three of the state's top offices that oversee elections. This adds to an already growing trend of Republicans winning Secretary of State races around the country. As your Secretary of State, I will continually work to protect the sanctity of our elections. To see how this part of the strategy works, we don't even have to speculate. It's already happening. Like in this small county in New Mexico, where in these recent primaries, the all Republican election board refused to certify the results because they said that there was election fraud. And they had evidence. This guy, the county commissioner, said that, quote, It's only based on my gut, my gut feeling and my own intuition, and that's all I need. Had told him that something was off with the Dominion voting machines. <laughs> what? Like, these are people in power. Their job is to certify election results. And because of one guy's gut feeling and intuition, they literally decided not to certify them. Oh, and by the way, check out where this county commissioner was on January 6, 2021. All right, y'all, we're here at the Capitol on the run. It's a great day for America. This one guy's baseless gut feeling was enough to sow confusion and doubt in the results. Okay, so now imagine the scenario where it's not just one random election denier in rural New Mexico, but election deniers just like him all over the country in key counties and states at every level of the state certifying process. Like imagine if the Secretary of State of New Mexico hadn't been a Democrat, but a pro-Trump Republican who indulged this guy's gut feeling about the voting machine. Oh, and now pair that with the precinct strategy that we talked about. And instead of one guy's gut feeling and intuition, it's now an army of election workers and election monitors who actually have been documenting and reporting a bunch of perceived instances of voter fraud. Their fleet of lawyers cataloging their affidavits, their reports, all in a growing body of evidence. And suddenly the entire system has been infiltrated. And a perfectly free and fair election could be called into question because this system that was never built to withstand the stress of aggressive partisan bad actors has been taken over with people bent on revenge, placed strategically at every level, all with a mission to re-rig the system and avenge what they believe was stolen from them. It's not work, it's personified by this, it's a scam. Oh, I'm starting to see it now. I guess my question is like, what are Democrats doing to counter this movement that seems to be quite effective and quite riled up? Is there any way to counter this effectively? You know, you wanna challenge every secretary of state race. You wanna have plenty of volunteers in uh, election precincts. You wanna have plenty of people fighting on the state level and the federal level. It's one big, long, 
slog. It's democracy and you basically have to take care of it in the long term or it kind of just falls apart on you. That's because democracy, this thing that we take for granted, is really delicate. It's new, it's not natural. It's this agreement that we've all made to, yes, disagree, but to at least play by some ground rules so that our disagreements can be fought with ideas and with order. So American politics has long been a blood sport of sorts. It's always been rough and tumble. You know, it, it has a certain kind of elemental viciousness to it. But if you're gonna have a democracy, it has to kind of operate on certain basic premises. And a key one of those is that at the end of the day, when the votes are counted, both sides agree on what happened. If you kind of blow up that basic building block, you're left with complete chaos. And it makes it really hard to do a peaceful transition of power.